thank you for um, coming along. My name's Guy Anderson. I'm a, a portfolio manager at JP Morgan, and uh, I manage the Mercantile Investment Trust, which is uh, an investment trust with a pretty long history. It goes back to 1884. Um, it has, over that history, had a number of different strategies, but for the last uh, nearly 30 years now, it has focused on um, delivering long-term capital growth by investing in a diversified portfolio of UK listed mid and small caps. So my focus is absolutely on the mid and small cap part of the UK market. So those companies um, that are established businesses uh, with uh, you know what I think of as uh, real p and so revenues and profits, um, but those companies that sit below the FTSE 100, so uh, those large cap companies that, that, that Ian was talking about before. Um, the the if if we jump to the next slide, this just shows the sort of um, the agenda or, or the the format I'm going to take this evening. I'm going to spend a bit of time making a case for uh, UK mid and small caps and why um, certainly I believe that they are a, a really attractive and really interesting asset class in which to invest. Um, I'll then spend a little bit of time talking about um, the strategy of, of mercantile and then you know how we're thinking about. Um, the UK markets today and potentially where we're seeing um, some opportunities. And I think, so maybe going into the case for, you know, why do I invest in UK mid and small caps? Why do I think that is an attractive part of the market? You know, perhaps if we could um, jump forward to slide three, um, this really uh, illustrates, I think, um, the strength of the returns that this part of the market has generated. Um, you know, ultimately, um, we're looking to make investments that will generate, um, you know, a good return per unit of risk, of course. Um, and what we're showing here is the returns across a number of different equity markets over the last 25 years. Um, and we can see the, the thick blue line um, the, the, that is towards the top end of that is the FTSE 250. The FTSE 250 is the mid cap part of the market, which is really the core of what I what I do. And that has returned, you know, north of... Um, 1200% over, over that 25 years. And then if we look down the chart, we can see another an, a number of other markets, including the S&P 500. And then the green line is the FTSE 100, um, which has delivered a return of about 300% over that period. Um, to put those numbers, they're clearly quite large magnitude. To put those numbers into context, um, the FTSE 250 has annualized an 11% return um, over that time period, which is around five percentage points per annum better than the FTSE 100. And clearly, you know, the power of compounding over, over time really magnifies that difference. Um, you know, for, for me, what do I think are some of the big drivers of that difference? You know, for, for me, it's absolutely driven um, by the superior growth characteristics of smaller businesses. And if we jump to the next slide, um, you know, this just gives a, gives a few uh, examples. And I think, yeah, it, it it makes sense. I think intuitively it makes sense that there's greater potential for smaller businesses to grow at a higher percentage rate than perhaps there is for large businesses. You know, ultimately larger businesses um, will have their growth constrained by the underlying growth of the markets in which they're operating, and you know, ultimately by um, the economic growth. So towards that, you know, two to three percent. Um, that, that, that Ian mentioned. I think smaller businesses potentially um, can be uh, quite nimble and so can be quite well placed to adapt to change. Um, it might be a surprise, you know, the, the, the WH Smith's logo up there or sort of picture up there that, that I've used to describe a nimble business. You know, clearly that's a business that has suffered tremendously through the pandemic. But actually, if we think back, this is a business that has been able to reinvent itself um, <clears throat> despite you know, substantial changes to shopping habits on the high street. You know, they have have actually grown profits in the, in their high street business uh, over an extended history, whilst pretty much every other business has has struggled to do that. And of course, they have they have moved into travel retail, which which um, you know, pandemic aside generally has has quite good good characteristics and continue to drive the growth. Um, in addition, I think this part of the market has quite a high preponderance of what we call sort of innovators or disruptive businesses that can take advantage of changes that they see in, in, in um, the market and therefore grow substantially. And um, Softcat, I think, is a tremendous example of that. This is a technology company, but this is a company that acts as the um, intermediary channel, so as the sales channel 
on behalf of the original manufacturers, so the Microsofts or, or indeed the dark tracers of this world, so the original providers of the technology, and they act as the distribution channel to sell those products um, to mostly mid sized corporates. Um, and clearly, technology is something that, you know, as all of us today <clears throat> sitting on um, on, on webcasts constantly and on Zoom meetings, um, we'll know that's that's something where adoption has 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 gone from strength to strength. And this is a business, you know, to talk about the um, the sustainability of the growth profile. Um, Softcat has now delivered more than 60 consecutive quarters of year-on-year -year organic revenue growth, which is which is clearly highly unusual. That's more than 15 years of consistent revenue growth every single quarter. Um, and so, you know, clearly we're, we're, we're optimistic about the future prospects there. And then thirdly, I think there are, you know, certainly at the smaller end of the market, opportunities um, to find companies which really can generate extraordinary growth, and there's a, there's a picture on the bottom of the slide which just shows a row of houses. You know, clearly house building is not is not a new industry, but there are many changes that are going on within house building and countryside properties. I think is a great example of a business um, that has built a a what they call a partnerships model where they're working in association with typically um, local authorities looking to redevelop and um, expand their housing stock. So I think I think that greater growth angle of mid and small size companies really helps drive that that superior growth. Um, and I think that ultimately is one of the great drivers of, of returns in this part of the market. Um, in addition to that, and if we jump to the next slide, I think another characteristic of the mid cap market and one that you know, if, if, if you've been following following the uh, financial press, there's been quite a lot of takeover activity in the UK at the moment. I think this this um, the, the comment that I think Ian made before about the UK market being at a, at a sort of 45 or 50 year low valuation relative to other markets, you know, absolutely resonated, and we're seeing a lot of incoming takeover activity. Um, so that is not always foreign buyers but often foreign buyers who are looking to bid for and acquire um, UK listed companies and of course they have to pay a premium to the share price um, in order to um, you know, acquire a, a, a business um, and it, it, I think it makes intuitive sense that there's a greater number of, of businesses um, that will potentially be looking at smaller companies than necessarily larger companies. And that's borne out in the evidence. And if, if we look at this chart here, um, this just shows the percentage of each of the, the components of the UK market that have been acquired in each of the years um, through this century, where the, the blue and the purple lines, bars rather, um, show the percentage of the mid and small cap markets acquired in each year versus the green line, which shows green bars rather, which show, show the percentage for the FTSE 100. And it goes up and down through the cycle, um, but it has averaged about 6% for mid and small caps each year versus about 2% for, for large caps. And that is important actually, because if you think on average, there's about a 30% takeover premium. Effectively, if you're buying the mid or the small cap market, um, one might assume that you get that 30% takeover premium on an additional four percentage points of your market, um, which equates to 100, uh, sorry, 1.2% of additional um, performance per annum, which is not immaterial um, when we when we think about how that compounds over time. So, so I think mid and small cap is a is a is a pretty attractive starting point given the. The superior growth characteristics. I think from from an active investor perspective, you know, from from my seat, I also find the breadth of opportunity to be a great characteristic too. And the next slide just tries to illustrate what I mean by that. Um, if we think about um, the, sorry, if we could turn over one one slide, um, th this just just tries to illustrate that. Um, the FTSE 100, the large cap market, is a highly concentrated index. So what I mean by that is the largest 10 stocks in the FTSE 100 make up around 40% of the index. In, in, in contrast, the 10 largest stocks in the FTSE, um, in, in the FTSE, uh, sorry, the FTSE all share, excluding the FTSE 100, so in other words, in the mid and small cap market, only make up around 13% of the index. So there's a far, there's not only a greater number of stocks that we can look at, but also they're, they're far more equally distributed or equally sized. So that has, I think, important considerations when it comes to uh, the level of um, idiosyncratic risk that we're potentially taking, i.e. stock specific risk that we're taking by investing in a single company. Um, furthermore, and maybe sort of finally on, on why I'm um, 
yeah, he's so excited about this part of the market. I think there are greater opportunities for active managers such as myself to add value as we move and look at smaller and smaller companies. I think, um, you know, intuitively, it, 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 it probably makes sense. There are far more people who are going to be looking at and analyzing, um, you know, an AstraZeneca um, than there are uh, people who will be looking at, you know, I don't know, a future PLC or some other company that many people won't have ever heard of. Um, and maybe to illustrate that, that if, we, if we jump to the next slide, um, this just shows um, the number of sell-side analysts that cover the various different sections of the market. And so effectively what this is showing, the, 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 it's not a particularly pretty chart, but the, the black section represents the FTSE 100. So on average, you get about 20 sell-side analysts looking at the FTSE 100 versus the green section, the FTSE 250, where, where there are about on average 10 analysts and then around five in the small cap. So I think it makes sense. There are fewer people looking at it. So hopefully there'll be greater um, opportunities um, for a manager to add value. So really that, that just sort of sets the scene for why I think this is an attractive space. Um, really ultimately it's about superior returns over the long term um, and you know, our, our you know, strong belief that that is due to sustainable factors, so structural factors as opposed to cyclical factors. Um, in terms of mercantile um, specifically, I'll, I'll run through this fairly quickly, but if, if we jump forward a couple more slides, um, I'll just give a quick intro into how we approach this part of the market because you know the, these are often um, companies that are not as well known um, and so in order to try and um, make the best possible investments um, we do uh, quite a lot of quite detailed analysis um, you know as, as I'm sure you know everyone does but quite detailed analysis trying to understand the businesses and one of the really important elements of that is meeting the companies that we're going to invest in um, so we have you know my in, in, in the, the team in which I sit which is the UK mid and small cap team um, we do on average 350 management meetings a year it was actually closer to 400 meetings last year so through the pandemic a huge Huge amount of interaction with companies and we really spend a lot of time discussing with the CEOs and the CFOs of the business what are the prospects you know what is the outlook for this business so that we um, believe that we are you know in a, in a strong position in terms of understanding what are the drivers of their future success um, the vehicle itself I don't really need to you know um, spend much time on you know mercantile is, is a, a sort of fairly well established um, uh, investment trust um, which comes with with decent scale which is just important in that it allows um, the trust not only to have pretty competitive fees but also it means we get that great access to those to those companies um, in terms of you know how, how um, you know how mercantile ha has performed the next slide which um, if we could jump forward one slide sorry um, this just shows the long-term performance um, since I I came on board back in back in 2012 and in that time period you know clearly you know, we have to be aware of investing in mid and small caps you know it, it can be um, you know it's clearly a non-linear journey so we have to have to accept the ups with 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 the downs as well um, and we can see that quite clearly when we when we look at this chart that shows performance over the last 10 years you know sort of two-thirds of the way along three-quarters of the way along but the 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 drop down that we suffered last year through the pandemic but over that time period looking back over over what is um whatever it is nearly nine years now you know we have have managed to deliver um what i think are you know pr pretty attractive returns um for shareholders um over that time period so the nav has increased by around 14 percent um per annum um and the total returns shareholders um i think close to 260 percent um in addition to looking to deliver the capital growth and again you know conscious of some of the comments about income income is of course you know one of the sources of returns um the the board of mercantile also look to grow grow the income at least in line with inflation and if we jump to the next slide um we can see that they have have, have um surpassed that that uh, ambition quite quite nicely over the, over the last 30 years um the dividend has grown at about an eight percent annual rate um, and that has has been continued even through the pandemic. So, of course, one of the the characteristics in the UK market uh, through the pandemic was a great cut in the the dividends that many companies were paying out to shareholders. Um, but because um, of uh, the 
uh, strength of reserves that Mercantile had built up in the preceding few years, and the board were able to increase the dividend again last year, which I think is a strong endorsement of um, the security of that income stream um, that Mercantile can provide. Um, in terms of um, how we approach investing and what we're looking for, I think I'll spend just a couple of minutes, and I'll do this quite quickly, but just just mentioning our investment philosophy because I think it is important. You know, we have what I think of as a as a pretty disciplined investment approach. And if you jump to slide 12, it just sort of gives the the high level view. Um, as I mentioned before, you know, one of the key considerations is that that we have is the company meetings and and meeting with management teams, and it's really there and in our analysis outside of that that we're looking to form a view of what is the fundamental strength of this business model so is it going to be able to deliver the growth that we are hoping for because that is that is of course a crucial driver of our returns um, we're then of course overlaying that what is you know the current view of the market versus where are we expecting the business um, to end up over the lifetime of our investment and we're talking about you know typically our, our, our average holding period is between three and four years so we are often looking to make you know long dated investments um, in companies and and we've got a quick example just on on the next slide which is um, uh, uh, an investment in a company called Dunelm which is the the home furnishings retailer which actually um, coincidentally uh, I, I had a meeting with um, Nick Wilkinson and Laura Carr the, the the management team this afternoon which was I think my first real in-person management meeting um, since since the pandemic started so it was a, a rare uh, joy not to be on zoom for a moment but uh, but actually see people in real life um, but the message of this business and why we're invested in this business is they are a a leading operator um, in the homewares market in the UK um, focused completely on the UK um, and the catalyst for making this investment, which which was initially in February of 2019, was really the work that Nick and his team were doing at putting forward their customer first strategy. So it was all about retaining um, the, uh, the sort of the value for money credentials of Dunelm whilst increasing their product proposition and working very hard on their distribution capabilities. So coming at it from um, you know a starting base of having uh, very much a bricks and mortar retailer and really getting it fit for purpose in the 21st century. So really putting in place a lot of things that we probably all take for granted, such as you know the ability to, to buy a product online, to, to look at their website, um, to log in as a user on their website, to add an item to a basket, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of things that you know are sound simple, but I think are quite complicated to, to actually put in place, but, but they've done a fantastic job. And what that has done is that has really broadened their customer base. And now the journey that they're on is all about increasing customer frequency. So it's not about trying to get people to pay more for the same product. It's just about selling more items to more people. And they've driven you know, tremendous growth in profits um, through this period and you know indeed over the long term this is a business that you know certainly since its IPO it's it's grown its revenue line at, at 10 percent per annum um, for an extended period of time and I think the outlook is is for for pretty good continued um, growth looking at looking ahead so hopefully that gives a little bit of, of color about um, the investment thesis and how we look at businesses and sorry I should have mentioned the valuation you know which absolutely is incredibly important consideration you know this is a business that is is uh, generating around a, a a six to six six to six and a half percent free cash flow yield you know on a steady basis um, with you know fantastic drop through of of accounting profits to cash which is ultimately the most important thing you know how much cash does a business actually generate because it is ultimately that cash that will come back to us um, the shareholders. Um, in terms of the the outlook and positioning, I think I think maybe just just in the interests of time, um, I will I will just jump over a couple of slides and just if we could jump forward to slide sixteen, I think I'll just I'll just make a couple of comments about why we think um, this is an interesting period um, for this part of the market. And I think the UK consumer, you know, we've clearly been through. Um, a, pre, a pre, pretty uh, substantial, you know, a very substantial recession. But actually, we've come out of it with the UK consumer in a very strong position. So there was significant reduction in expenditure last year, which meant that household savings increased quite markedly. So we're coming out of this recession where the consumer has effectively a lot of excess cash, whereas usually we come out of a recession where the consumer is very stretched. And so the result of that is, I think, there's an opportunity for a substantial growth in consumption 
um, which is clearly one of the greatest drivers of um, uh, the UK economy. And um, in addition to that, I think there's an opportunity for business investment. And on slide, if we jump forward a slide, you know, there's, there's an opportunity for business investment to really pick up. Um, if we just just consider the chart on the right hand side, this just shows business investment with um, surveys of investment intentions. And we can see there the purple line has really jumped up. So businesses are expecting to invest more, particularly now that um, you know the re economic recovery is in sight, which I think is is fantastic. Um, and then when we uh, consider the valuations, of course, you know, Ian's already covered a lot of this, so I could be quite quick. But if we jump to slide 19, this just shows looking at through a slightly different lens. This just shows equity valuations looking on a cyclically adjusted PE basis. Um, so think about the last 10 years of earnings of the US, the UK and, and, and Europe. And um, you know, it's pretty clear that there the dark line along the bottom is the UK at a substantial discount to international markets, um, which which I think is, is interesting because not only do we have a very um, positive view on the outlook for the economy to recover, um, also we don't think that overall the assets are, are overly priced. So I think the valuation should not be a, an excessive hurdle. And then sentiment is is clearly beginning to turn more, more positive towards the UK, as, 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 as I think I men mentioned earlier. So how does the portfolio try and benefit from that? Um, if we jump to slide 21, just jump forward a, a couple, please. Um, you know, it, it's this portfolio is very much portfolio built on bottom up stock selection. Um, so that will remain the case. But you know, companies such as Softcat, which I mentioned, Dunelm, which I mentioned, are absolutely some of the larger holdings. Um, but we really do cover a range of different stocks and sectors. And of course, very happy to, to take any questions. But in the, in the interest of, of time, I'm just a little bit conscious of the, of the clock ticking. Um, I will probably um, just move on to the summary. Um, you know, to summarise, if we jump forward to slide 24, um, yeah, in, in summary, I think UK mid and small cap equities are a very attractive space with quite robust structural drivers. Um, and, um, you know, we have a pretty, pretty promising outlook at the moment where I think the, the healthy UK consumer combined with what is clearly a pretty strong global economic recovery and furthermore, quite attractive valuations in the UK, I think certainly point to um, this actually being a pr pretty favourable time to invest in um, UK assets. Thank you. I think I'll leave it there.